Good afternoon, and thanks to everybody for being with us today as we launch the Imagining the Digital Future Center at Elon University. Like an exciting day. This center is a new iteration of our long standing Imagining the Internet Center, which has involved hundreds of Elon faculty, students, alumni, and staff in public good research projects since 2000. Their hard work has brought to light ideas and issues tied to the evolution of digital life. So let's put the past two decades of digital communications innovation into context. 20 years ago, in 2004, there were 745 million internet users globally. Facebook got its earliest start in a Harvard dorm room back then and then soon inspired social media's dominance of culture, good and bad. Its parent company, Meta, is now valued at $1.2 trillion. Now, 17 years ago, in 2007, the first iPhone was released, and the transition to mobile computing took hold. There were 1.2 billion people online globally back then. Today, many more billions are accessing the internet now by simply tapping into their smartphone. These sophisticated pocket-sized computers are in use every day all around the world. We consult our digital connections for knowledge, work, socializing, news, entertainment, navigation, personal health, I know the number of steps I walk every day, and more. Our lives have been changed in ways that very few saw coming in those earlier times. Today, 5.4 billion of the more than 8 billion people on the planet use digital tools. These technologies have quite literally changed our world. Most people say their lives have been enhanced. Most also worry about the serious downsides of digital life's influence on societies, human rights, human well-being, and human institutions. The rate of digital change today has raised significantly more challenges and opportunities than humanity has ever had to face. Elon University's Imagining the Internet initiative was launched in 2000 to document people's hopes and fears for the future of digital life. The goal has always been to inform the public at this time of accelerating change. Elon researchers led by Professor Jana Anderson in partnership with Elon parent Lee Rainey, head of Internet and Technology Research at the Pew Research Center, have released dozens of studies of experts' insights about the future, of, about the future over the last two decades. In listening closely to experts, they spotted emerging trends and told us what was coming. A mind-blowing knowledge explosion resulting in positive breakthroughs all across different sectors, especially in science and health. They told us about the diminishment of privacy as the selling of people's personal details and traits became the foundational business model of the web. They warned us and predicted the blurring of the line between people's work and people's personal lives. They told us about challenges to institutions due to the manipulation of information and of people's emotions, seeing extremist groups blossom and democracy become under stress. They told us about the changing character of work and the evolution of jobs. The positive and negative changes in people's well-being as they immerse themselves online. Considering the impressive foresight that documented, 
considering the impressive foresight that was documented by Elon researchers over the past two decades. I'm especially eager to learn what this research turns up next. Consider this. Just 14 months ago, at the end of 2022, the public release of ChatGPT kicked off the generative AI revolution. OpenAI, a company most of us hadn't even heard of, I think Dr. Haya Jean showed it to me. She said, Connie, you've got to see this. Uh, it was the day after it launched, and then she, when I balked and said, yeah, that's not, that's not. She said, no, Connie, this is going to be important. <laughs> but I also uh, famously told Jana Anderson that Facebook wasn't going to last. <laughs> Eventually it will fold, <laughs> and I'll call her. <laughs> um, but most of us had not even, how many people have chat GPT? Yeah, so I, I have it on my phone too. Uh, that company is now valued at $29 billion uh, in just 14 months. Quite remarkable. Artificial intelligence is spurring a global debate about where our digital tools and systems are taking us. Today, we are seeing the first wave of AI digital assistants that are built to help us take better shortcuts to thinking and reasoning and understanding. AIs that will do research, writing, and creation for us, influence what we read, watch, do, most importantly, what we buy, offer all sorts of guidance and advice, and even serve as our personal representatives. Consider the change that connected people, consider the change that connected people have been experiencing the past 20 years and then imagine what AI might do over the next 15. That is exactly the subject of imagining the digital future's first research report, which continues the legacy of imagining the internet's 48 previous reports. This new report looks at the potential impact of artificial intelligence on people's personal lives and on societal, societal systems by 2040. And we are truly fortunate that Lee Rainey has chosen to join us at Elon University to lead the new center after his distinguished 24-year career at Pew. Welcome, Lee. So under Lee's guidance, Elon's Imagining the Digital Future Center will remain a global leader in this critical research. We will help identify the best path forward. We will inform the public, especially those making key policy decisions. I invite you to learn more about it and get involved in this work over the next year. Lee, you've been a great partner with Elon for more than two decades. And we are thrilled that you've joined our community, and we are excited about what the center will teach us in the future. Please welcome Lee to the podium. I am so excited to be here. I've been working in the shadows for months, and now I, I've had my birthday. And, uh, and it's the Big Bang moment for, for the project. Um, you don't begin any presentation like this without thanks and a heart full of gratitude. I'm grateful to President Book, who as Assistant Professor Book was the one who hatched the idea of student engagement with my new center at, at the Pew Project. And we decided that studying what experts had to say about the future was a good idea. So thank you for that. And everything that you're going to see about what we released today, some of which we'll be talking about now, is really the fruit of the labor of two other people, Jana and Dan Anderson. Jana, my longtime research partner. Dan, because he's the jack of all trades and does everything, and he, the website we built was his. And it, it, it was, it's a prodigy of effort, of intelligence, of display and thoughtfulness about information, and I could not be more grateful, and I'm also grateful to the staff for putting together Michelle and her team for this amazing event right here. Um, so 
um, we're, we're talking about the impact of AI, and I wanted you to see what you yourselves had been um, doing when you were filling out this poll, because I'm going to later in the presentation compare you to the general public uh, of adults in the United States, and we'll see how Elon students, faculty, and staff compare um, with, with other things. So can you switch over to that uh, other uh, format, and we'll, uh, we'll see where you, where you stand on all of this. So 50 surveys were completed. Um, you're more positive than, uh, than, than negative, uh, or sort of trending positive when the question is, how will it affect people's daily lives? Uh, you'll see that that's pretty interestingly different from the way the public feels. You're pretty interestingly positive about um, how uh, it will, well, you know, you're not. You're negative about the way it will affect uh, privacy compared with uh, things that are existing now. You think it's possible uh, for people uh, to design artificial intelligence computer programs that can consistently make decisions in people's best interest. One of the huge challenges of this, of this work is whether they, we're going to outsource to machines the things that will make decisions for us, whether, whether it will work out or not. So you're, you're trending towards positive, and, and many of you are not sure about that. The impact on human rights is, uh, is sort of up for grabs. It's a little bit of a split verdict you have uh, in there. Um, the impact on employment, the next, sorry, the next screen is, um, is basically a split verdict. It's gonna be equally positive or negative. Same percentage say that it's uh, negative compared with positive. Then when we look at work tasks and activities, um, you all are thinking that that's, that's pretty good. Uh, the day-to-day -day work task, which is, stands in such interesting contrast to um, the, the public views and probably your views about job opportunities themselves. So in your day-to-day -day work, this stuff might work out really well for you, but in the long term, as it replaces skills or performs skills that humans used to get paid for, uh, that's one of the huge tensions of uh, this era. Then next slide, we're going to go to uh, mental health. And it, again, very much a split verdict, and that's pretty close to where the public was. Go to the next slide. Um, relationships with others. You're more negative than positive. There's a way in which lots of people think that this is going to get in the way of the standard ways that humans interact with each other. Indeed, as the very definition of what it is to be human is sort of up for grabs in this era, and I think that's reflected in a bunch of your answers. Uh, next slide. Uh, wealth inequalities is something that's, uh, that's a major factor that uh, you all are, are more convinced that it's going to be negative than positive. And I think that's in line, for instance, with a lot of what the experts told us, but the general public was not quite as convinced of that. The next slide will be uh, civility. Again, sort of the judgments that people are making in here, somewhat like the judgments you're making, are what, what is this actually going to do to the way that, uh, that community and social interactions uh, play out with each other, when we've got maybe agents dealing with other people instead of us physically dealing with other people and things like that. So you're sort of skeptical about that. The access to information and knowledge from trusted sources, more positive than negative. So it's interesting that in the midst of a political season where the whole idea of misinformation, disinformation is up for grabs, you're hoping that these tools are going to uh, uh, solve these problems, and your judgment is that they probably will. Okay, next slide. Quality of uh, medical care people will receive is going to be, you're convinced, as is the public and as is the expert world, that the results will be more positive than negative. I think there are lots of ways that this plays into diagnostics as well as treatments and new, new drugs and things like that. The next slide is politics and elections. You're just where everybody else is on this. Um, and I think this reflects just the large sense that people have that politics and elections in this country are so divided that the partisan polarization is, is you know, a dominant force in the culture. This is only gonna add to the way that that moves through the culture. Uh, colleges and universities, you're more positive than negative. Okay, uh, that's, uh, the public isn't as convinced of that uh, as you are. Um, and so there's the good that you all who are sort of living in the midst of this are, are thinking that this is gonna work out okay. And that's the end of the presentation. So I will go back to the, uh, <laughs> the, the slide presentation where I, now I'm gonna show you where you stand on these same questions. So when the question is results in people's lives, it's, a, it's very much more split verdict uh, than, than you guys were showing because it's um, basically it's, it's four slices of the pie that are roughly equal in shape. 
Um, the next question is about, what, is it possible for these machines to make decisions that are in humans' best interests, particularly in complex situations? Again, split verdict and the highest number of the general public think that um, they're not sure how this is all going to play out because they're not sure of the capability these, of these tools. They've heard some good things, they've heard some not so good things, and that's weighing on a lot of their answers. And then here's some of the particular things that, um, that we asked about that were um, on your survey as well. When it comes to people's privacy, they're where you are. It's much more likely to turn out bad than turn out good as we disclose more things to these tools and as these tools are built into like our goggles and our lines of sight in, the, in parts of the world, it's just easier to figure out who we are and what we like and how we can be moved in a certain direction. Uh, human rights, again, sort of a, a more negative than positive verdict about where that's going to end up. When it comes to opportunities for employment, the public is, is very nervous about the impact on jobs, even as they said exactly as you said, that the day-to-day -day enactment of these things and their integration into our lives is going to do pretty well by us. It's much more of a split verdict and people can see the ways that this will help. Uh, mental health is, um, uh, mental and physical health, again, more likely to think that it's going to be a negative result than a positive result. You all were in a very different space from that, so that'll be an interesting debate coming through the rest of the culture. Uh, people's relationships with others, they think, like you do, that it's going to be more negative than positive. On wealth inequalities, they're much more likely to think that it's negative than positive, and I, that, that's kind of where you all came out. Civility is something that they're really worried about, and it, it wasn't quite reflected as, as much in your data, but it's clearly something that people are going to be watching and that a lot of your research might be affecting. And then knowledge from, uh, from uh, accurate sources and things, they're a little bit more divided than, than you were when you were when you were looking at that question. Uh, healthcare, there is, it's the one clear area where the positives outweigh the negatives, and I think there's, there's ways in which your answers reflected that. Politics and elections, there we go. Uh, the, the general public is as skeptical and worried uh, as you are. Colleges and universities, uh, the, the public is a little bit more worried about your fate than you are about yourself, so yay, yay for that. Um, and so that, those were the sort of core things that we were finding in the public opinion survey. So one of the fun things to do when you do survey work is to help people figure out where they stand in the data. And you guys are interestingly unique or different from the general population, but there are other ways in which you are uh, quite in line with things. So that's one part of this, the report that we issued today, but the other thing was that we did the thing that Jana and I have done for 24 years, which is ask experts about the future, and we asked them, how's this going to turn out by the year 2040? And they gave us five big themes that I, I wanted to run through really quickly here. The most metaphysical thing that they said was that this, the whole idea of being a human being is going to have to be reimagined. The, the boundary between human and machine, the very essence of what human intelligence is, the essence of what human creativity is, the essence of community, the essence of, you know, maybe our avatars are going to interact, and so is that really me? interacting with you or how are we going to be figuring that? So the whole uh, idea of what, what are humans good for is up for grabs in this area and these experts were really you know, interested in that. They also talked about humongous change in institutions and big systems in society. New norms, new kinds of institutions, particularly governmental institutions because the corporate institutions seem to be doing okay in this era. But the idea that, that sort of big public agencies are going to have to change it was on the table in part because humans themselves uh, are going to be changing. They talked about um, enfeeblement. There are ways in which these, as these tools become integrated in our lives, particularly these experts were thinking, um, they'll do more for us than we, uh, stuff that we used to do for ourselves. And what's that going to mean, particularly if the tools that we're given are run by big uh, corporations that want to sell us stuff and want to understand you know, what moves us, what nudges us, what uh, drives us, what can predict our behavior and things like that. And so there's a sense that these tools are going to get way good at figuring out our needs and serving them without us actually having the agency ourselves uh, to do that. Um, then there was a really interesting um, branch of argument here is that you're, you're too technologically determinist in your ideas. You're, you're giving too much power to technology. We can control it. I mean, particularly at this pivotal moment, there's a sense that we can make the choices right now about who controls it, 
how it's enacted, what are the guardrails, what are the other kinds of regulations to do on this. So the sense that uh, the technology isn't the thing to worry about, it's the humans who run the technology and make the decisions that are the ones to uh, worry about. And the final thing is that, of course, all of these experts, even the ones who are the most downcast, uh, can cite many ways that they think that things are going to work out well. Uh, they would talk a lot about the medical space. They talk a lot about maybe in, in solving big systems problems like environment disease detection and, and things like that. There are ways in which these tools will serve humanity incredibly well, make our lives safer, actually make them more interesting, uh, get rid of some of the most boring stuff in our lives that we would, that we would just as soon uh, get rid of. So there, there are lots of ways that the, these experts can, even as they worry about things can say how it's going to play out for good. Now it's up to you to start talking about these things. Uh, we want to have table discussions for the next 20 minutes led by someone at your table and maybe and there are pieces of paper at your table. We hope someone will take notes at your table and give them back to me either at the end of the day or s send them to me. I'll give you my email address in a minute. But we want you to, um, to, add, to, to really concentrate on two things to talk about. What are the most exciting and unexpected benefits you think these tools are going to give us in the next uh, de decade or 15 years? And what are the most harmful and unexpected problems they're going to give us? And if you feel like it, you can also give us plenty of advice about the research questions that you hope that we will tackle uh, in the future. So you got about 20 minutes to discuss that. Afterwards, we're going to invite uh, each table to give a really short presentation about what you've talked about. And ideally, it'll surface a whole bunch of interesting and creative ideas. So ready, set, go.